Pentecost. And he, he says then, this passage beautifully extols the sufficiency and supremacy of Jesus Christ and reveals his total dominion over the created order. And so it was just a thrill as, as we were preparing and as I knew Dr. Epperson was gonna be leading today on this whole idea of the systems and, and systems thinking to see that we are imitators of God and imitators of Christ as he is, as, as Dr. Epperson has shared, Christ is Lord of the system. So Dr. E, if you were gonna share something on that after, I apologize, but um, anyway, I hope that, no, I hope that's okay. I, I, again, I appreciate the, the, the reminder again, if the, the, we have to look at the primary model. And, and again, it's what we, when we see him correctly, when we understand that model, Peter, and it's, it's so critical to this whole entire thing. And we, we, it, it's, I, I think speaking from our heartbeat, if I can, Peter, it's trying to balance leading people and doing it God's way. And one, one great point of encouragement there is he's designed it. It's his, he's given us the playbook. And so while it may be a complex or it may be difficult to lead people and serve people and do what we've been called to do, he's given us a structure on this. And it's a critical foundation point to understand, right? Guys, I'll, I'll jump in here from a, a reminder. And I, I like to think at Ken started out this, or Dr. Bo started out with this chapter talking about uh, providing a really good example of, of a system here, if you will. Many parts, one body. And so again, I'm gonna I want to read this to you here. Um, the body is a unit. It comes from 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 17. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. Okay. And though all of its parts are many, they form one body. We'll talk about this from a science perspective here in a second, but again, these these themes are the same, and I'm gonna try to parallel these up for you. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body's not made up of one part, but of many. So he goes on to say, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. See what he's saying here. See what Paul is, is laying out. Even though Christ's body is comprised of many members, it's one. Okay. Great diversity. Every member is equally a part of this. Equally a part. Look at, look at this again as, as Paul continues down. Okay. But in fact, God has arranged, Lord is the, the God of the system, has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Okay. You look down a little bit here where it says, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. Here it is, the crescendo. Peter, I'm going to ask you, if uh, you would, would you give us a, uh, a Peter Johnston interpretation of this one, but I want to read this to you. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its part should have equal concern for each other. Peter, what do you think on what what's going on here? What's Paul driving at? Well. 
you know, we as humans sometimes magnify certain people and different groups and such. And it's just the opposite as far as what God is saying. He's, he's saying even the ones that we think shouldn't have honor, uh, that we, they really do. And it's, a, it's an admonition to us to uh, change our thinking and uh, not look in the typical human way, but to look again, as you talked right at the beginning, you seeing through God's eyes, seeing through God's eyes and remembering that each person within this body from God's standpoint is absolutely critical, um, just absolutely critical. So. Different view, you look at the world's perspective, right? It's all about who's who's most important, who's in power, who's in charge, who has the most money, who has the best looks, who has uh-uh, that that's not not the model we're talking about here at all. The um systems as as we see here, and I wanted to provide a, an example of this. I, I love that quote by Margaret Mead, but but what happens when you get a system of people together or a group of people to do something? things happen. Here's my point, okay? In the body of Christ, in the system that God arranged, that he set up, we come to faith with him and as one, but we grow in community. We mature in community. We we get challenged in community. Um, we get encouraged by community. We get disciplined by the system. Is that making sense? Peter, any word on that before we move? Well, just one, and that is that God's system is an organic system. And that's why I love your, that you're addressing this as far as uh, the body, because sometimes from a business standpoint, we start thinking in terms of organizations, inorganic organizations. And yes, business people are responsible for inorganic organizations, but Christ's body is organic. And we have to keep that in our heart and in our mind that, um, that it is. It's living. It's not just an inorganic or dead sort of system. And um, that, anyway, I, I just wanted to point mention that as far as it being an organic body, not just an organization. And, and what, what gives it the juice? What gives it life, Peter? It gets back to what you shared earlier out of John 1, uh, John 15, 1 and 5, uh, the vine and the branches. We have to be attached to the vine. We have to have the life of Christ <laughs> flowing in and through us. And that only happens if we are attached to the vine, if we are attached, abiding in his word and allowing the Holy Spirit to flow in and in through us, then we can live that out organically. Apart from him, as <laughs> you have covered and, and uh, stated as well as I have at different times, apart from him, the scriptures say we can do nothing that has eternal value. Amen. Well said, mentor, sir. Even though you're, you're on uh, teeth work, recovery there you're you're not chewing on your tongue though <laughs> thankfully <laughs> yeah, right. i've done that um a, a couple of things again i wanted to remind you I'm, I'm trying to bring several ideas and concepts together guys into into one one lecture and i will try not to fail in this but when we think about the dynamics of the body of christ right it's a system okay and life together in the spirit is a source of spiritual health it's source of spiritual maturity but it it's it's the fragility it's it's the it's how vulnerable these systems can be we were created for community with one another right do you remember the, the two greatest commandments? Love God, and then what? Love our neighbor, right? And it's the, the clearest expression of our love of God is our love of others. In effect, if you love me, you'll love others. 
Okay. This is why we're making the arguments of community. It's why we're making the arguments of, of, uh, of system here. So just trying to give you some examples as we go through. So as, as we begin to look at any type of system, you need to understand and look up what makes up that system. So for lack of better terms, we'll imagine that we've got the OU football team, right? And so on the OU football team or the University of Oklahoma uh, football team, you have a coach, you have players, you have cheerleaders, you have band, and there's all of these things that goes into making up a great day of football in Norman, Oklahoma. And all these things have to work in conjunction. They have to work simultaneously for the outcome to be what we want. But we've got a problem here in the Western world, at least. And what we need to have in place in order to create and build successful organizations, churches, and families is community, just as we talked about. We need the system. However, one of the things that, that we are continually leaning into heavily is this idea of independence, right? I don't need anybody. I am fully sufficient in and of myself, right? I don't want to be dramatic about this, but if you guys remember in Isaiah 14, what, what was Satan's I will, right? I will raise my throne above yours. Okay. I will set enthroned on the Mount of Assembly. It was a calling. It was a demand for independence. It was a demand from one another. There was no submission in that. It was complete autonomy. I will not submit to you, right? You think about how that's been manifested in the day-to-day -day world of a lot of our, our people, right? Right. We believe in the doctrine that we have to do it alone. We have to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and go make a dent in the world. And that, again, that's not the community. Two, self-preservation. Um, that uh, self-reliance, self-preservation has become a cult in, in our, at least in our Western culture. And that cult drives us further and further away from dependence on God. Why? Because I am sufficient. I am good enough. And it's a lie wrapped up in good, marketable junk. Number three is control, right? It, it's, I want control. I have to control this, right? Our culture has been marked by a quest for independence and control and privatization and avoidance of accountability and all the things that we don't like about community, right? I don't want to go to my brothers. I don't want to go to the guys that I meet with every week and say, guys, I, you know that thing that I told you I wasn't going to do anymore? Well, I did it again. I, I don't like that. I don't want to tell them that I, I, I didn't hold up my end of the bargain. But every time I have to tell them I failed there, I, it drives me to where I need to be. Accountability is a really powerful thing. We avoid it. We run from it. Then finally, superficiality. I'll, I'll give this to you in the redneck Oklahoma way. Mm -hmm. What superficial relationships are, are relationships without love. It's that simple, right? Superficial relationships are relationships without love. You cannot love someone and live at a superficial level with them. It just doesn't, it doesn't jive. Peter, any word on that at all? Yes. Um, you know, here in the Western world, we are afflicted with this whole idea of independence. Um, and it has been said that independence from God is the cardinal sin of mankind. Mm -hmm. We here in the United States have been blessed and cursed by something in our American heritage called the Declaration of Independence. 
I, we are incredibly blessed <laughs> that our country did separate from Britain and was the first country ever set up on an idea of liberty. And that's outstanding. But people miss the fact that a couple of facts related to that Declaration of Independence. It could also be called a Declaration of Dependence. Independence from Britain, but dependence upon God and dependence upon one another. No single individual could have successfully declared independence from Britain and our nation have become independent. There was there had to be a unity among people here in the United States and a tenacity, including that dependence upon God, which is written into the Declaration of Independence. You read it and you will see there, there are statements declaring dependence upon God. And so, but because of, of that historical importance of the document, the Declaration of Independence, I think we in the United States take that in light of our own independence from one another also, and that we magnify the how, how important it is for, for me as a person to have excelled, for me as a person to have shown what I can do, like you were talking about Satan before. And so we in the United States could benefit greatly from those of you who are in other cultures that really value the community much more than us here in the United States. Amen. Good word there. And then just to, I want to follow up on, on what my mentor said there. We are closest to human. And I, I'm going to try to say this in a way that makes some sense. Um, I'll try to say it like a Texan, but I don't think I can. We are closest to human when we are in Christ. Amen. Fully alive, actualized, to use that word, we are closest to our original design, our original intent. We are closest to human in Christ. Our old self is non-human. It's dysfunctional. It's mentally unstable. We were not designed to walk and live and interact and commune and work in the absence of our creator who is perfectly mentally sane, who is perfectly functional, who is perfectly stable. In his absence, we're not just going to magically fall backwards into that. And we have to accept that, that truth, I think. So going on, I would I want to I want to show you another video, and this one's this one's called God's Fingerprint, and what what this brings up, and I, I want to tell you this story really quick. Um, this was one of the most life changing moments for me um, in my life, truth be told. So it's it's 1999. I'm I'm sitting at the University of Oklahoma, and I'm sitting under a professor emeritus at OU who was not a, not a believer that I'm aware of. He was about 97 years old. He was even older than Peter. And he was showing us a video from Margaret, um, Margaret Wheatley. And it was called the, the New Science of Leadership or something to that effect. I cannot remember the, the name of it. But basically, she was showing a discovery about fractals. And I was watching this video of having Margaret, a professor out of, I think it's up in the, the Northeast somewhere, talking about these fractals that are repeating patterns all throughout nature. And I'm sitting in this room full of, of different people, and I'm watching this video, and I'm like, Oh my goodness, do you see the handiwork of God in this? And it was the same pattern at all kinds of levels. And I thought, oh my goodness, God's handiwork truly is demonstrating something. And, and as my classmates, I wanted to stand up in my chair and say, do you see? Do you see this? Look what, and um and and we we didn't talk about clearly that at all, but I I stood there and watched and and sat in awe of of 
of my God and, and what he's created. I want, I want you to see this video and it talks about the, the Fibonacci sequence. It's a mathematical sequence, but what we're going to do is try to bring in the system of science, bring in a little bit of mathematics. And I think what's going to happen here is you're going to look at God's handiwork and go, whoo, that's fun. All right, here we go. Let's hope it works. Every day we see patterns in the world around us. They testify to the careful design and hard work that produced them. But what about the patterns that are not made by man, but appear in the natural world? What do they reveal? Consider the snowflake. These tiny crystals are formed when water vapor in a cloud condenses directly into ice. As the crystals grow, delicate and beautiful patterns emerge. Look more closely at the pattern within a single snowflake. The crystalline arms branch, then branch again and again at increasingly smaller sizes. Mathematicians studying this concept of self-similarity use the term fractal to describe a shape that has a consistent, repeated pattern at multiple scales. Where else can fractal patterns be seen in the natural world? Trees can demonstrate a degree of self-similarity. The trunk splits into limbs, which split into branches, then twigs, and so on. We see a similar type of fractal pattern in the leaves of a fern. A different type of pattern, but one that is also a fractal, can be seen in the shell of the chambered nautilus. As it grows, the nautilus builds new, larger chambers and seals off the older, smaller ones that it no longer needs. The result is a spiral that is fractal in nature maintaining a similar shape as it increases in size. Natural spiral patterns of this type can be observed in many places, from the cloud formations of a hurricane to tiny shells on the beach, from the arrangement of the stars in a galaxy to the seeds on a sunflower head. What causes these spiral patterns? In the case of the sunflower, it has to do with the specific angle at which new plant growths form. This angle, approximately 137.5 degrees, is sometimes called the golden angle. It results in an ideally compact arrangement with no wasted space and creates distinct spiral patterns. If the sunflower grew not at the golden angle, but at a different angle, for example, 140 degrees, we would see radial arms instead, and the seed arrangement would not be as efficient. As we look even closer, we can discern a fascinating mathematical relationship between this golden angle and a series of numbers called the Fibonacci sequence. In this progression, each number is determined by adding the previous two numbers together. Interestingly, these Fibonacci numbers can often be observed in plants. This sunflower has 34 spirals in one direction and 55 going the other way. Both of these numbers are in the Fibonacci sequence. A pineapple will often have eight or 13 spirals. Flowers with a spiral growth pattern tend to have a Fibonacci number of petals. Why are these numbers significant? As the Fibonacci sequence progresses, the relationship between successive numbers comes closer and closer to defining the exact value of the golden angle. This intriguing mathematical relationship between the golden angle of plant growth and the number of resulting spirals reminds us that the patterns we see in the natural world are not merely accidental. Each one is a reflection of order and careful design. As we take time to examine these patterns more closely, we are filled with a sense of wonder at the workmanship of their designer, Jehovah God. 
for his invisible qualities are clearly seen from the world's creation onward because they are perceived by the things made. Peter, as, as you watch that, what, what immediately came to mind? I know, I know you're a, you're a thinker and uh, curious what you thought there. Well, I am a thinker. I'm not a scientist. I am a thinker, and I do appreciate beauty and order. And what came to mind, uh, Dr. Epperson, was seeing, going back to this scripture out of Colossians about Christ being Lord of the system, seeing another example of the order in the system of net of nature, how it's created, it my 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 belief my hope my trust is that this is helping all of us who are watching this right now to grow in our trust in how big our creator is and at the same time how personal he is and so that's my heart is that in seeing that and and this is the first time i've seen what you just put up there I, i'm really thrilled with how you're handling this dr epperson um, but first time for me to see it, but it, it it's helping me and I hope it's helping everybody to get a sense of how detailed God is, our creator. And if he's that detailed in some of the design of what we just saw in a plant, how detailed is he and how he made each one of you, each one of us on this Zoom conference? And detailed in the people that he has caused us to interact with. But thank you, Peter. And it's just yesterday to, to that very point, we were, we were talking about uh, a website and kind of the theme that we really wanted to present. And the, the thing that meant most to me one guy mentioned, I, "I want refuge." Another guy said, "I want to get, I want to get motivated, inspired." And and what speaks to me most is sound, reliable, right? To know that God has capacity, cognitive ability that is mind-boggling puts me in a place where I look to him and I say, I trust you more because I see clearly how little I know, how much he knows. And the more that we see ourselves in comparison to him, the more things just line up well. And, and I think it's an important piece. Guys, I'm going to, I'm going to jump real quick to tangible and wanted to set up the framework. What is systems thinking? Systems thinking is seeing, trying to see the whole picture, right? But also understanding how all the relationships work with, within the picture, okay? And so it's not these snapshots that, that we take in time, right? If, if Timothy, I'm, I'm studying Timothy, for example, I'm not going to go to Timothy's house and, and watch him pour coffee and then walk out the door, right? I'm going to watch Timothy from the time he gets up. I'm going to watch how he relates to his, his family. I'm going to watch if he gets coffee. I'm going to watch when's he eat, how's he react, what's he thinking about, what's he doing. I want to know it all. Why? Is it because I'm obsessed with Timothy or is it because I want to understand him? It's because I want to understand him, right? Like Timothy, I love Timothy. I care for Timothy. But if I understand Timothy, I need to see his whole day. And this is really a little bit of, of what Peter Singe is talking about on this quote to the right. Now, what you guys probably don't know, or Singe, Peter Singe wrote the fifth discipline. Um, I think that's what it was called. <laughs> I probably had Peter and uh, Judith read that one one time years ago. Judith probably didn't read it, but Peter probably did. Judith, am I right about that? Yeah, at least I know, right? At least this professor knows if she's reading it. But, I, had a fear, I had a fear of my professor, so I would have read it. <laughs> right. 
Judith's been through, she knows. But but Singe was a senior lecturer at MIT. Um, he, he's kind of a, a staple in business management theory in terms of the learning organization, um, this system that organizations exist in. And, and what he put here um, is a great reminder. And we wonder why our deepest problems never get solved. I'll tell you the reason why at least my clients don't solve their problems is because they're lazy. They think lazily. They don't go into detail. They solve the wrong problems. They don't look deep enough. They don't know what they're looking at. And deepest issues never get addressed because we're always trying to get to the quickest, fastest solution. And sometimes that's okay but often it's not. And so we've got to understand what we're looking at in totality to make some sense of things. Um, this slide here, guys, I'm, I'm going to try to hurry along here, but this pure academic over here on the left and intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction, right? Simplicity, understanding, making things clear. We understand some of the connections, elements in a system. What depends on what? What is causing what? Where does information flow? What comes out of that decision? What creates that? And so we're trying to understand the, the big picture. And so what I wanted to do here is, is give you guys... Uh, a little bit of an example of this. This is an iceberg model for system thinking. Um, as a leader, you need to not, I repeat, do not just assume problems. As, as people who are not in charge of leading and influencing and directing and loving and caring for people, you can get by with not really understanding the problem, but if you're leading and loving people, you need to understand, okay? So let me explain this process. It's really simple, really, really basic. So we're, we're gonna kind of take this in reverse. So we're starting at the very top of what is seen in an organization. So let's assume we're at a church and you got all these grumpy church people at your church, okay? And uh, number one, we, we have events, and the tip of the iceberg is where did the problem manifest, or how did it happen? In other words, the church caught on fire. That's the event, okay? So we are reacting to that event. Next level here is, is we look below the surface. We look below the water a little bit to consider what may have contributed to causing this thing to happen, okay? And is, is it because we were, we were having a campfire in the children's building that we caught the church on fire? Was it because the air conditioner or the heater was bad? Was it because we, we had someone that just decided to burn down the building, right? What just happened? And so we're looking for patterns and trends. Who was here? What was going on? And then finally moving into level three here, what underlying structures might be influencing these patterns? Okay. Over the summer, the, the pastoral team made a decision not to replace the filter in the heater. Huh. Really? Okay, so we're going a little bit deeper. We're trying to find out what's going on. What's the relationship between the fire, the heater, and the repair person? And then finally, we deep dive into these mental models, which is the very, very deepest level. Okay. And it's, it's basically, what are the assumptions, beliefs, and values that we hold, that we have, that are driving these structures and these patterns and these events? 
Guys, so often here on number one, we people will complain over and over about the orange trees in their front yard, but they keep planting apple seeds and can't figure out why they keep getting oranges, right? When we're leaders and we're trying to understand the complex problem, we have to begin at the very bottom is how do we see the world? And do you guys remember this acronym? We talked about this several months ago. PTFAR, here we go again. Our philosophies and our perceptions drive the way we think. The way we think drives the way we feel. The way we feel drives actions. Actions we take drive results. You look at that model overlaid on this iceberg, same thing, mental models. What do I believe? What's true, right? One leader may see a certain event as a, as a complete disaster. Another person may look at a, a bad event as a, as a benefit, right? Um, if I'm a cleanup company and your church burns down, I'm going to make some money off of that, right? So that is like, hey, great, another church burned down. The value that I'm placing on that event will dictate how I feel and the actions I take. Does that make any sense at all, Judah? All right, I'm, I'm getting the I'm getting the thumbs up here, guys. Reminder for you when when you're looking at issues, problems, you're looking at your church or your organization. Here's one thing that you, no one really likes. Okay, I I remind my clients often, and they don't like it and I remind them they pay me to this okay we see the world as we are not as it is what what does that mean well in the leadership context your read is not reliable all the time there's a one percent chance that you are a hundred percent wrong okay you look at that from a spiritual perspective your lens is not fully reliable how do we ensure our lens is fully reliable Mentor Peter, how do we ensure that our perspective and our lens is fully reliable, biblically speaking? We, we uh, attach ourselves to the uh, one who is our Lord through his word and through the spirit. All right. We can rely on that. We cannot rely on ourselves. So really quick, tools. I want to give you some more and more basic tools. And, and I stole this from a, a woman named Layla. And uh, I, I'm not going to try to pronounce her name, but this is her model. And I loved it. I, I really like the way that she handles systems thinking. It's a whole lot clearer than the way that, that I learned it uh, many years ago. So again, here's some some different things to to look at. But there are, are six kind of key things going on here. And, and I'm just going to jump in. So tool number one, tool number one is this notion of interconnectedness, okay? Interconnectedness. In the new age, sort of godless theology, not theology, but just sort of this godless mentality of we're all one and, and sort of Jesus and Buddha. And it, that's not what we're talking about here, guys. We're talking about interconnectedness in the sense that systems thinking requires a shift in our mindsets from linear to circular. Okay. In other words, it's not just straight path. There are a lot of things going on at the same time. Everything is reliant upon something else for survival. Humans need food. We need air. We need water. We're not independent. Okay. Trees need carbon dioxide, sunlight. They need sunlight. We all need something else. Okay. And if we can begin to look for that, when we have issues, problems, how are all these things connected, okay? So that's one tool. How do we draw all these disparate, separate, different things and look at the connections between those? Does that make sense, Judith? Are you bored yet? No, no. You wouldn't lie to me, would you? 
No, I'm back to my, my MB class. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So going back to systems thinking, kind of a tool number two is this idea of analysis and synthesis. And some of you, many of you might actually hear this stuff and go, that is not how I was taught to think. So again, that, that's why we're looking at this. Synthesis, okay? Synthesis refers to combining two or more things to create something new. That's synthesis, okay? Combining two or more things to create something new. And when it comes to systems thinking, the goal is synthesis, not analysis. Does that make any sense at all, Peter? When it comes to systems thinking, the goal is synthesis, not analysis. Yeah, that and, sense? yeah and simply the whole is greater than the parts. We, we want to see the whole because it's greater than the sum of the parts. Got it. Right. Judith. Because we have pastas here, I'm trying to think as a pastor, how do I use this system to look at the church or my ministry to either try to solve problems or even build systems for, for my, my group, my church? How, how do you do that? I will give you an example of that um, here in about three shakes of, of how to kind of map that out on, on paper. But it, but a leader, and here's one thing that to answer that, leaders tend to look at organizations as departments and divisions and organizations, right? We, we tend to think in mass. We tend to think in populations. The problem is, is that followers don't look at the relationship with the leader that way. They look at them one-on-one, -on -one, <laughs> right? It's, it's you and that leader, and that's how they see the world. And so often when a leader is looking at everybody on their team and you may say, well, I can't look out for everyone on my team. My answer would be then get out of leadership because you're not doing it right. And so, again, when you when you look at these things and understanding of the people under your charge, how they connect, where they're gifted, where they're weak, where they need your help, where they don't need your help what you can delegate, how you can support them, um, what you can do to encourage them. But at the end of the day, you got to know who they are. You've got to understand that and how the whole of all this talent. And you look at, for example, this is Judith right here, that one puzzle piece, right? So there's Peter, there's me, there's Ryan, there's Rochelle. But we don't have Judith in there. And when we figure out how to bring Judith into this puzzle, everything comes together and we finally see it all. Okay. And so what we're trying to do is bring many, many things together as a leader and to create something new really quick. I'll get through this kind of a, a third one is this notion of emergence. Large things emerge from small things. Large things emerge from smaller parts. It's the natural outcome of things coming together. Just like that, you got two silos. You got Judith and you got Brian right there. We're two different entities, but then all of a sudden you put us in the same room together and we have emerged as one, okay? A simple example is a snowflake we just talked about in that video. It forms out of an, an environment of biological elements, its temperature, its patterns. It's these molecules of matter that are all being brought together to create something. We need to understand that. System four, really quick, feedback loops. Since everything is connected, there needs to be feedback loops. There needs to be mechanisms for understanding how these things connect. And, and I'm, I'm gonna try not to beat a dead horse here to explain this, but bottom line, two areas. We can live in isolation or we can live in relationship. We talked about that in the context of community. 
But when we look at understanding an entire system, we have to look at what is reinforcing the system and what is destroying the system. And as a leader, we've got to understand these things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Two more slides will be done. Tools of system thinking number five, it's this idea of causality, how one thing occurs because of something else. Okay. What caused it? And causality is a, is a concept in systems thinking. And it, it's really the goal is to understand how one thing affects another. Okay. Connections, relationships, intentions. Guys, if, if you endeavor to lead other people, right, it is, it is so much more complex than you will ever dream that it is. That shouldn't discourage you. All it should do is remind you every morning to get up and Lord, help me see and understand this. Guide, lead, direct my leadership. But as, as leaders who have been put in charge of shepherding their people, you've got to understand these details. Last step here, it's it's one of the fun things I used to do in corporate life was map these things out. This, this system mapping is how you take all these connections, all these parallels, and put them on paper so that you can begin to see how all these things fit together. And what the biggest value of this is the non-obvious connections between the problems that have been caused and what you need to do to climb out of it. My mentor, her name was Dr. Van Gundy. He called me Throckmorton. I'm, I'm not sure why to this day, but he was my dissertation chair. And um, one of the things I always remember him saying to me is he was like, Apperson! And I was like, yes, sir. Never solved the wrong problem. And he'd say it like that. And then he'd drink his wine and shut it back. In the middle of the day, he was kind of a weird professor. But he said, we're always solving the wrong problems in business. He said, you've got to understand the problem before you solve it. I'll never forget that. I think in many cases, his reminder, Van Gundy, thank you for the reminder of that. And then I'm going to leave it with this. Here's the system. Here's the model. Here's how you lead the complexities of individuals and all the crazy that comes with leading people and all the problems that comes from it and all the attempts to understand the why and the how. Jesus reminds us all, right? I'm the vine. You are not. Stick with me. I will stick with you. You will bear a ton of fruit, but apart from me, you're not going to do anything of significance. Guys, you can try to squirt out of that. You can try to wiggle out of that truth. But the fact of the matter is, is it just can't be done. I've tried. And then we get to a place in life where we finally submit to the fact that his ways are just simply better than our own. We can take the things we learn about science and, and structure and, and try to apply those and learn some things where we can stay bracketed in, lynched in, walk with him and go make an impact and do it in a way that, that he has deemed <laughs> appropriate. We are not our own. And so hopefully that was fun for you. Um, Stay in the vine, kill the ego, and give us a good dad joke to Peter. All right, Peter, anything else? Yeah, uh, I just want to affirm how you concluded this, Dr. Epperson, going back to the branch and the vine. We have heard a lot of great, uh, we've had a lot of great illustrations today. I, I want to encourage everybody that was a part of this to take one step at a time. And the most most important step is to stay focused you can begin to adopt and apply some of the practical illustrations that Dr. Epperson has given, begin to apply them. But don't get overwhelmed. Stay, stay focused on what we're sharing here as far as being a part of the 
the vine and then take a step at a time. And I do encourage you uh, it, to go back into the book and read a couple of the illustrations, the biblical illustrations that Dr. Boa used of Jonah and Nineveh. And again, keep that pers the big perspective of Christ being sovereign over all. There were things that Jonah did, and recognize this, there were things that Jonah did that impacted people way outside of himself. And that's true of us also. There were things that that uh, Nehemiah did that on a positive way that impacted people way beyond himself. And so let's continue to stay attached to the vine and continue to recognize we are 100% dependent upon God. We cannot do it in and of ourselves. And as we continue to take one step at a time, looking at these this sort of system thinking, uh, we can continue to grow in him, in Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Judith, yes, what, words, what words of African words of wisdom do you have for us today? Because then I'm going to ask Timothy what words of wisdom he has for today. That we live in a community and the community has a system. And that system includes everything. If, if it is a church and one department is being affected, you want to look at the whole picture. Why are people coming late? Is it because the ushers are also late? Or why is, uh, is there a problem in the choir? Is it because the pastor also has a problem? So you, you need to look at how everything is, like the picture you, you showed of the birds, how everything is affecting everything. That's, that's my summary. And instead of just solving one problem, look at the effect of it's having on the whole picture for, for it to be a community, for us to continue to be in a community. Otherwise it will be just divided groups in a community. There'll be no unity. That's my summary of systems thinking. Judith, you could have done that in five minutes and saved a lot of trouble. Guys, I'm, I'm sorry that you had to endure all that as opposed to what Judith just gave you in terms of the summary. <laughs> on on that, but I got an A. That is that an A? No, you still get a B plus. But I I I wanted to tell you guys, um, Judah's summary on that was yeah. Again, we have to understand the complexities and and try to understand why 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 is that? Because so often, just because we feel it in our hearts or we think it's a great idea, or we're just convicted. Um, and I mean, if God is speaking to us, we need to follow that. But, but at the same time, just because you feel it doesn't mean it's the right answer. <laughs> and, and so you have to really analyze and, and understand the components here, because I see it in churches, I, I see it in businesses, Leaders will attempt to solve a problem with a very easy solution and then create two, three months of problems down the road because they didn't solve the right issue from the beginning. And as leaders, you've been given charge to do it. And we're all going to fail at it. That's why we have the Lord says, stay, stay touch, stay with me. You'll bear much fruit. And Timothy, any words to close? Oh, Peter? Well, go ahead, Timothy, then I'll come back. That's an A minus or A plus, Judith, right there. That, that's Bias. an A minus, A plus right there. Favoritism. You always like Timothy above everybody. 
Well, just for the record, I was going to say something before Timothy, and I was going to say for the record that I was going to give you an A, Pastor Judith. Okay, so in any event, and an A also or A plus also to you, Timothy. And then one final thing: next week we are looking at team building, which is chapter thirty-four. We'll be looking at team building for next week. Yeah. Yeah. Remember this book, it is a PDF. Peter got us all uh, physical books to make sure we, we actually read them. That's how he keeps us organized. But there's a PDF of the book that's on the chat. Please go through so that these things make more sense, but also you will have it as a reference. Just remember we are, we are allowed to use it within ourselves and not to copy it to, to the world. So I wanted to point that out. Thank you, Dr. E. That was heavy, but you, you went through it successfully. Of course, because you're the prof the professor in you, well, I think didn't feel anything. Dennis, are you okay in Turkey? Minus the coldness? I am very okay, only that I keep myself under the blankets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's warming up here. And Pastor Rajab lost a sister, so sorry again about your sister. Uh, Pastor Rajab, I think the barrier was yesterday. May God continue to comfort you. Pastor Martha, uh, Joel, uh, I don't know if that's Dr. Joel. Timothy, is that Dr. Joel? Joel, identify yourself. I know we are a little bit of time before we pray. If you can say hello, that's okay. But uh, Sarah and everybody else, Joseph, thank you for coming. Let's pray. We need to pray. Timothy, since you, you're being favored as usual, you're mm -hmm. going to pray for us. Let the A student pray. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and then as we go out, we leave the, the Dr. E's song so that he feels more more appreciated because he did a good job today he did a good job thank you peter you survived it we didn't feel the dentists work <laughs> you did well you did well okay let's pray timothy Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So switch off your videos, let the music go. You exit whenever you feel like, but we'll 